Should animals be included in antinatalism? <coughs> this topic has been hotly debated by antinatalists for years and years and years. And in this video, I want to go over why I think they do belong in antinatalism, what that means, what the implications of it might be, and also what are some of the arguments against that, and why I think those arguments fail. Now, the best place to start is obviously to define what the word animal means. In this video, I'm using animals to mean non-human biological individuals who are sentient. And by that, what I mean is have a subjective experience where they can experience positive and negative states. But the key one I think we'll be looking at is negative states. Now, of course, this isn't the actual taxonomical definition of animal, which I will pop up on screen now, because I don't think the taxonomical definition really gets at the crux of what the argument about animals in antenatal is about and that's whether homo sapiens one species of animal should be included in antinatalism or if the wider group of all sentient beings should be included in antinatalism and of course i know some people will be thinking this that there are similar ethical issues with creating non-biological sentient beings although i don't think if it's even possible those are identical they are similar so stuff in this video will be relevant to that but i think that topic is for another video so i'm going to strictly stick to non-human animals that are sentient in this video. Anyway, I think that is enough of definitions and I think it's time to get stuck into the video. So before we dive into the actual arguments before and against including animals in antinatalism, I think it would be useful to quickly map out a way of how we can actually navigate this question. And to do that, I think we need to start by taking a look at antinatalism itself. So in my current thinking on antinatalism, the best way to me to conceptualize it and talk about it is how Thaddeus Metz described it. Contemporary antinatalism is fascinating and important for acquiring sophisticated reflection on the evaluative question of how to judge the worth worthwhileness of lives and on the normative one of what basic duties entail for the creation of new lives. So here he identifies two parts to antinatalism, an evaluative part and a normative part. So the evaluative part is obviously evaluating something. So in the antinatalist case, that would be evaluating coming into existence. The normative part, on the other hand, is a moral judgment of an action taken that is relevant to the evaluated thing. So in the case of antinatalism, that action is creating a new being. So to make this a bit clearer, let's lay it out and I will put this up on screen. So the evaluative part is coming into existence is a harm. And obviously some people will say sentient existence or just human existence. And the normative part is creating new either sentient or human life is unethical. And a quick side note, I've actually been told that splitting antinatalism into these two constituent parts has actually been done as well by the German philosopher Oliver Halick in this book. But to my knowledge, it is only in German at present. So if you speak German, it's great for you. You can check that out. If you can't, then maybe in the future you will be able to access that in a different language. Anyway, moving on. So I think the best place to start is the evaluative part of antinatalism and talking about whether animals should be included in that or if it should just be reserved for one species, which would be Homo sapiens. So obviously the evaluative part would center around whether existence is a harm to humans alone or if it's actually a harm to all sentient beings. But to be honest, I actually don't think this is where most of the disagreement is going to be. I might be wrong on this, but I think that most disagreement that people are going to have with each other is on the normative part about putting moral judgment onto actions when it concerns animals. The normative part of this conversation would be about whether it is unethical to create other animals alongside it being unethical to create other humans. But this part of the conversation actually gets a bit tricky because there's actually two situations when it comes to creating new non-human animals. It can either be humans that create them, such as the case in, for example, example farming or it could also be that animals are creating each other so when humans breed other animals into existence there's a moral agent involved so it makes sense to talk about that action in moral terms but animals aren't moral agents themselves and so when we talk about them bringing each other into existence it isn't as clear that we can use the same language and make the same judgments so that makes the situation a bit more complicated but we'll shelve that topic for now because we'll talk about it later and i feel like we've now laid out a decent enough path on how we can discuss this issue and before we actually have that discussion and we will get to it i want to just take a detour to talk about why we should have this discussion like why is it worth having in the first place 
Why is this an important question as to whether animals are included in antinatalism or not? Well, it's important because it gets to the center of a debate that has been happening for years amongst antinatalists. And that's whether antinatalism is anthropocentric or sentiocentric. And what the implications of those two things would mean for the actions we take. So for instance, when it comes to advocacy, an anthropocentric antinatalist conclusion may lead to advocacy that resembles something like the voluntary human extinction movement where they advocate for uh, the voluntary cessation of human breeding and therefore the extinction of the human species. A sentiocentric antinatalist conclusion, on the other hand, in advocacy may share the same long-term goal of human extinction, but they may sideline that in the short term to pursue a more focused effort on other forms of activism that address non-human animals. So for example, that could be advocating for a vegan food system. It's also the case that antinatalism doesn't just just have implications for our reproductive choices. It also has implications for other aspects of our behavior as well. So for example, a sentiocentric antinatalist may want to divest any of their money and resources from industries that partake in the breeding of non-human animals. So one way they could do this is to personally be vegan. Now, obviously there are also reasons why an anthropocentric antinatalist would be vegan, but they may not be the exact same reason as sentiocentric antinatalists. And actually, Karim Akama talks about this topic in this article, which I'll link in the description so anyone can go read it if they think they'll find that interesting. So, now we know why it's important. Let's get into the actual discussion now. So first I'm going to go over why I think animals should be included in antinatalism and where I think the boundaries of that are. And then I'm going to go over some objections that I've heard and respond to those. I think the most reasonable place to start is with the evaluative side of antinatalism and trying to cross the species barrier when it comes to the evaluative side. So to begin, I think it would make sense to start where we all agree, and that is humans are harmed by being brought into existence. As antinatalists, we all believe in this common foundation to antinatalism, but but some people, namely anthropocentric antinatalists, draw the line there and claim that it's only humans, homo sapiens, one species of animal that evaluation is true of. But how can that belief be justified that a human is harmed by their existence, but a puppy born in a puppy mill is not harmed by their existence? Well, to justify such a belief, someone defending it would have to come up with some morally relevant difference between human existence and non-human animal existence, such that human existence is a harm, but the existence of all other animals is not a harm. So what could this difference be? What could this trait be that this difference in evaluation rests on? Well, I've done my best to try and find people who advocate for this position. I have looked at literature and I've posted in the anthropocentric antinatalism Facebook group to ask their opinion. And I've come up with a range of traits which we can go through. So first I'm going to present them all and then I'm going to respond to them all. Now, when I'm presenting these traits, I'm going to put up quotes on the screen of different people that that have argued for different traits that justify this difference in evaluation. But I'm not saying that those quotes accurately represent those specific people in their entirety because I'm sure they've said other things elsewhere that may mean that they've changed their opinion or they have a different opinion, but that those quotes accurately represent the argument for that trait that's being put forward. So trait one, the fear of death. Humans are consciously aware of the fact that we are going to die, but animals are not. So this trait is basically death anxiety. Not just anxiety over the process of dying, but anxiety over just the idea of death itself. In the chapter, additional remarks on the doctrine of the suffering of the world from Arthur Schopenhauer's second volume of this, because I'm not going to attempt to say it. He says the following about the difference in death anxiety between humans and other animals. But through all of this, the measure of pain in humans grows much more than that of pleasure, and it is greatly magnified, particularly by the fact that death is actually known to them. Whereas animals Animals instinctively flee it without actually knowing it and therefore without ever having to focus on it. The second trait is temporal awareness. So humans can accumulate suffering in the past, present and future, whereas animals only exist and experience the present. So in his interview on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Julio Cabrera references Arthur Schopenhauer's work by saying that animals lack 
for the awareness, reflection, feeling of past and future and certainty of death that produces a quality of suffering unique to humans. And to hear from the man himself, Arthur Schopenhauer says again in his chapter, additional remarks on the doctrine of the suffering of the world. A human being has no more in terms of real physical pleasure than an animal, except in so far as his more highly magnified nervous system intensifies the sensation of each pleasure, but also each pain. This comes about primarily from the fact that in him, everything undergoes a powerful intensification by thinking of the absent and the future. For along with reflection, the animal lacks the condenser of joys and suffering, which therefore cannot pile up as this occurs in humans by means of recollection and foresight. Instead, in animals, the suffering of the present always remains, just as it is the first time. The suffering of the present, even if it recurs innumerable times in succession. So here, what I think Arthur Schopenhauer is saying is that we can basically suffer three times from the same event. We can think about it in the future, endure it in the present, and remember it in the past, whereas other animals can only suffer in the present. He actually clarifies this more when he says about animals. Animals are the embodied present. The obvious peace of mind they partake of in this manner often shames our frequently restless and dissatisfied state brought about by thoughts and cares. Consciousness is limited to the intuitive and thereby to the present which is why it experiences an extremely brief fear and hope only in connection with objects that already exist intuitively in the present, whereas human consciousness has a horizon encompassing the whole of life. Trait three is existential suffering. So humans have the capacity to existentially suffer, whereas animals don't have the cognitive capacity to experience this. <coughs> So whilst existential suffering isn't actually mentioned by name, Peter Reschel Zapp's The Last Messiah embodies this point quite well. So in his introduction to the English translation of The Last Messiah, Trine Riel says that the overdeveloped human intellect, which Zapp calls an abomination and an absurdity, an exaggeration of disastrous nature, can in a similar way be seen as the result of a blind and highly unfortunate organic mutation. Unfortunate because it makes life existentially unbearable and categorically Categorically unsustainable. So this capacity to suffer existentially through a perceived lack of meaning or purpose is something that certain individuals say separates human existence out from other animals. Other animals can suffer in a range of ways, but humans are unique in that they can understand consciously that their suffering is for no ultimate reason, or they suffer directly from the fact that their life has no ultimate meaning or purpose. As Zapf himself says, the animal too knew angst during thunderstorms and under the lion's claw, but man came to feel angst for life itself. And trait five is a lack of sameness. We can't make judgments about the existence of other animals because they're so different from us, we don't understand their existence. So this is a more general point that actually isn't really about a trait, it's just about the fact that we have a lack of understanding. Essentially, animals are too different from us and so we can't understand their experience of existence. This is actually a point that Thomas Nagel makes in his book, A View From Nowhere. In the book, Nagel talks about how he once liberated a spider from a urinal because he concluded that the spider would be miserable and exhausted and so he thought that he would help the spider escape this situation but once he helped the spider out of the urinal the spider actually quickly died and Nagel uses this anecdote to highlight as he puts it the hazard of combining perspectives that are distinct. So I'm actually going to deal with this one straight away and come back to the others after this. So the point that Nagel is making about how one part no matter how good their intentions are, can harm another party when trying to help them because they may not accurately understand the conditions they're in or their interests. I think this is a valuable point to make, but I think it can only be taken so far. I think sometimes people lean into this observation too much to argue against any attempt to identify sameness between two parties. Taken far enough, this observation could be used to drive a wedge between any two parties that differ in any way. In fact, it could be used to drive a wedge between any two individuals. Someone could make the same point about the differences between men and women, or cognitively impaired people and non-cognitively impaired people, not just spiders and humans. The thing is that despite differences between groups, we can still recognize that we are similar in some anatomical and behavioral behavioral ways such that we should care about others who are different from us in a moral way. And for antinatalists, caring about them in a moral way is recognizing that they'd have been better never coming into existence. And I would say this is the case for non-human animals. The behaviors they exhibit show a clear likeness to us. Behaviors that show feelings like joy, fear, 
anxiety, loneliness, boredom, and way more. They also have nervous systems similar enough to ours that it's reasonable to assume, and experts have concluded, that they are sentient in ways that matter to us about our own sentience, and that's the capacity to suffer. I think that even if someone is not totally convinced that we understand the experience of existence by animals, I think that even if there's some evidence, we should err on the side of caution and not create them. At the end of the day, no one's harmed by their non-creation. In other words, it's better to not create someone and find out that it would have been fine to create them than to create someone and find out that it was wrong to create them. Anyway, so let's go back to the other traits. So these are the traits that I've seen people claim separate out humans from other animals in the evaluative sense of antinatalism, that existence is a harm to humans, but it's not to other animals. Now, it's not going to come as a surprise to you that I disagree with these traits, and there's two main reasons that I disagree with them that we're going to get into. So firstly, to justify a morally relevant difference in evaluation, we need to base that on a morally relevant difference in the two groups that tracks the same line as our moral differentiation in the evaluation. But the thing is, all of these proposed traits fail to do that, and they fail to do it in multiple ways. So the first way is that they don't actually point to a difference between humans and other animals. They point to a difference between a certain group of humans and all other sentient beings, i.e. other humans and other animals. Existential suffering, the fear of death, and temporal awareness all require a certain level of cognitive capacity to be present. And there are many human beings that don't have the sufficient cognitive capacity to experience these things. So three examples are a young child, a cognitively impaired person, and an elderly person whose mental faculties have deteriorated. So these groups of people, and maybe more that I haven't thought of have as far as we know the same or lower cognitive capacities than many animals and so to point to these traits as a justification for a difference in moral evaluation doesn't create a line between humans and other animals it creates a line between some humans and other humans and all animals. The other way that these traits fail is that the line that they establish is actually porous and individuals can move across it. And the way that people move across the boundary is by moving in and out of the groups that I just described. So for example, a very young child will lack those traits, but as they mature, they will gain them. Another example is a mature adult who has those traits and then sustains some sort of brain injury and loses them. So if someone is going to base their evaluation of coming into existence being a harm on those traits, traits, they're going to have to accept that they don't apply to a lot of humans and also that people can move in and out of coming into existence having been a harm to them and not having been a harm to them. To me, this seems like very shaky ground on which to base your evaluation. The second reason I reject these traits is because I think they actually all point to one fundamental underlying trait that actually includes animals and that's the capacity to suffer. Each of these traits point to a specific form of suffering and try to use it as a way to differentiate humans from other animals. But I've never heard anyone actually explain why these specific forms of suffering constitute their sufferer as having been harmed by their coming into existence, given that the other forms of suffering presumably don't, otherwise they wouldn't have singled this one out. They each seem to suggest that this specific form of suffering is the one that makes coming into existence a harm, and the others, whilst they cause suffering whilst you're alive, don't specifically categorize coming into existence as a harm if you experience those forms of suffering once you're here. Why are those forms of suffering worse though? Why is existential suffering worse than the raw physical experience of being stabbed with a knife? There doesn't seem to be any reason given for this or an obvious one that I can think of. There also seems to be a lack of appreciation for the magnitude of suffering as well. So for example, a human that is born and can existentially suffer but actually has a pretty good life and existential suffering only punctuates their existence is harmed by their coming into existence. But a pig on a factory farm is not harmed from their coming into existence because they can't existentially suffer. The only trait that I can see that is consistent, that actually encompasses all of those other traits and encompasses all humans, is the capacity to suffer. The thing is though, that also encompasses other animals. Even Schopenhauer recognizes this in the piece that I was quoting from before. I can never look at such a dog without heartfelt compassion for it and deep indignation for its master. And with gratification, I think of the case reported a few years ago by the Times of a certain lord who kept a large dog on a chain. Once strolling through his yard, he could not resist the urge to pet the dog, whereupon it immediately tore open his arm from top to bottom, 
justifiably. It was trying to say, you are not my master, but my devil, who makes my brief existence into a hell. May this happen to all who keep dogs on a chain. Any being who can have an existence that can be described as hell, I think is safe to say that they were harmed by coming into existence. And maybe we live in different degrees of what Schopenhauer called hell. Each individual, let alone each species, will suffer to a different degree. Someone in great luxury may not suffer as someone living in poverty, but neither of them may suffer as much as a pig on a factory farm. But that doesn't mean that each of them were not seriously harmed by coming into existence. So we've looked at the evaluative side of antinatalism, but what about the normative side? And that's the side that says the being who's coming into existence is evaluated as a harm. It is unethical to create them. I think, again, it's easiest to start where we all have common ground. And so that would be that it's unethical to create other humans. And it's interesting. One of the arguments along these lines is Julio Cabrera's moral impediment argument. He argues that humans have what he calls a moral impediment, that humans have a structural impossibility to be moral and not to harm a use and exploit others. So he says that human existence is burdened with this moral disqualification. Not only are we creating new moral agents, but we're creating severely flawed moral agents. Again, in his Exploring Antinatalism interview, what did not work is the human life. The other animals are fine as they are and would be much better off without the sufferings introduced by humans. So that's an argument that makes the normative part of antinatalism stronger for humans alone. But let's get back to whether the normative part of antinatalism antinatalism can actually apply to other animals at all. So the most obvious place to start is by looking at the breeding of other animals by humans, whether that be on farms or in laboratories or in puppy mills. Now the evaluative and the normative parts of antinatalism actually focus on different parties in the act of creating new life. The evaluative part focuses on the being who is created and the fact that they're harmed. The normative part focuses on the party doing the creating, the fact that they've acted unethically. So if for the sake of argument we accept that animals are included in the evaluative side, it seems clear that on the normative side animals would also be included when it comes to humans breeding them, insofar as the individual who is in focus when it comes to the normative side is still a moral agent, a cognitively competent human, and the one who's being created, albeit they've changed species, is still being harmed by their creation. So the two essential features of the normative part of antinatalism remain intact, that there is a moral agent involved in the decision and that the one being created is harmed. The question becomes trickier when we move to animals creating each other, and predominantly we're talking here about wild animals. Whilst animals in the wild and any other animals that breed amongst themselves are still harmed by coming into existence, the ones creating them aren't moral agents. And as this is the case, only one of the two necessary conditions to meet animals being included in the normative part of antinatalism are met. So for this reason, it doesn't make sense to include them in the normative part of antinatalism. And David Benatar has actually commented on this. Whether my argument for antinatalism also applies to wild animals depends in part on what exactly one means by antinatalism. If it is the view that bringing a sentient being into existence is wrong, then antinatalism cannot usually apply to wild animals given that procreating wild animals are not moral agents. There would be exceptions where humans played a role in helping wild animals to procreate. Those humans would then do wrong. However, if the term antinatalism is understood as the view that coming into existence has negative value, then antinatalism could also apply to wild animals. If that's the case, then while we cannot blame wild animals for procreating, we could say that it would be better if they did not procreate. We might even say that such procreation is pro tanto prevent worthy, assuming that there are not sufficiently strong countervailing considerations not to interfere. So before we get on to anything else here, it's actually interesting that Benatar actually kind of also hints at this way of breaking antinatalism down into two constituent parts, namely the normative and the evaluative parts. But anyway, at the end of his quote, Benatar talks about how whilst we might not be able to morally condemn animals for breeding amongst themselves, we can recognize that there's a, a significant amount of of harm being done. And given the harm being done in the evaluative sense of antinatalism, we may actually have sufficient reason to intervene to prevent the harm being done in this unfortunate situation. 
intervening to prevent sentient beings from coming into existence is not the same as not creating them. And as Benatar says, while preventing wild animals from bringing each other into existence falls outside the scope of antinatalism, we may have sufficient reason to go beyond antinatalism and help alleviate the unfortunate situation that wild animals find themselves in. And in this section, I'll be explaining the thought process behind that desire to go beyond antinatalism. But before I do that, I actually want to point out that it's actually very common for antinatalists to want to organize around an ethical issue that isn't strictly part of antinatalism. Both abortion and the right to die are ethical topics that antinatalists often talk about and often organize around because of the clear links with antinatalism even though they aren't technically part of antinatalism. And I believe the case of wild animals bringing each other into existence is a similar ethical issue. So let's get stuck into it. So in his essay, The Speciesism of Leaving Nature Alone and the Theoretical Case for Wildlife Antinatalism, Magnus Vinding makes the case that not intervening in nature and leaving wild animals to procreate amongst themselves is actually a speciesist position. And just for anyone that hasn't heard the term before, speciesism is simply the act of discriminating against an individual individual based on what species they belong to. And speciesism is something that should be rejected alongside racism and sexism. So Magnus starts by actually talking about how people generally tend to agree that we should help other people who fall foul of natural ills like disasters, starvation, disease, and even predator attacks. And that we should do this even when we're frustrating the interests of another party who may be doing the harm. In fact, he states that in many cases it would be cruel not to intervene, like in the case of smallpox, where if we had the capacity to eradicate it, but we chose not to, this would be a cruel thing to do. However, when it comes to non-human animals, it's very common for people to take almost the opposite approach when non-human animals fall foul of the same natural ills. And the stark difference in people's approach to the same issue but with a human and a non-human victim is really highlighted by the fact that in the case of non-human animals in the wild, the conditions are just so much worse. Now, if you want to learn about the lives of wild animals and the variety of harms they face, because that is not really the topic of this video, I would recommend checking out Animal Ethics video course and the website Wild Animal Suffering, and I've linked both of those in the description. But what about when we're specifically talking about the intervention of preventing procreation? Well, Magnus argues that the badness of the lives of wild animals actually provides an overwhelmingly strong justification to make this intervention. He says the reason the reason one need not argue for radical positions on procreation in order to make the case for wildlife antinatalism is, in a nutshell, that life in nature is for the most part extremely bad. In fact, it is so bad that even the most conservative position on human procreation would, if applied without speciesist compromise to the circumstances of non-human beings in nature, recommend wildlife antinatalism, at least for the vast majority of beings. To illustrate this, he uses the survival rates of infant lions. So in lions, one in eight male cubs survives until adulthood. The rest generally tend to die of starvation, illness, or violence. Would these circumstances of male infanticide be permissible in the human context? It seems reasonable to say that most people would say that procreation wouldn't be permissible in these circumstances. And the thing is that male lion cubs aren't even representative of most animals. Fish would be a more representative example. Magnus talks about the female Chinook fish, which usually lays around 5,000 eggs. Over half of these eggs hatch as small younglings called alevins. And out of these thousands of young fish, only about 20 will reach adulthood. That's a survival rate of less than 1 in 100. Again, who would find this morally acceptable in the human context? And even if we focus on the ones that survive into adulthood, their quality of life, or lack of quality of life, would also make a similarly strong case. So if we wouldn't accept these conditions for humans, which I don't think anyone would, then accepting them for non-human animals seems to be simple speciesism. Now, Magnus here is making a theoretical case, not a practical one. There has been research done into how contraception can improve the lives of wild animals who already exist and will exist in the future and prevent many from coming into existence. I will link a bunch of that in the description so you can check it out. And if anyone knows of any more research that's been done that I haven't included, please send it to me and I'll include it as well. So now I'm going to respond to some common objections people put forward to going beyond antinatalism in this way. 
Argument one, we should focus on human procreation because humans are the ones that we can reason with. This argument assumes that appealing to someone's sense of reason is the way that we should determine who we want to influence. The thing is, we manipulate the behavior of others all the time in completely reasonable ways and not via appealing to their sense of reason, often because they don't have a sense of reason or that it's very limited. We do this with children, we do this with cognitively impaired people, and we also do it with other animals. If one child is hurting another child in the playground, we don't appeal appeal to their sense of reason, we physically shut the situation down, and if we are going to appeal to their sense of reason at all, we do it after the fact. So it doesn't seem clear to me why appealing to a sense of reason is the thing that we should be defining our actions by, especially when the individuals we're talking about don't have a sense of reason. Argument two, intervening to help wild animals could actually backfire and so result in more harm. Peter Singer has actually made this argument before in his book, Animal Liberation. Judging by our past record, any attempt to change ecological systems on a large scale is going to do far more harm than good. We cannot and should not try to police all of nature. It is true that attempting to help someone can backfire and cause more harm than good. But there are a variety of ways that humans can help wild animals and not all of them carry the same implications or risk of harm. So to dismiss intervening on the grounds that it could backfire really doesn't appreciate the nuance of of the different risk profiles of different actions that we can take. But also more generally, I don't think the fact that something comes with a risk means that we shouldn't take it if there are other things to take into consideration. One consideration is that the conditions that wild animals are in now is very, very bad. And so not taking action just maintains the current situation. The risks associated with intervening in nature, I think are an argument for intervening in a considered way, not an argument for non-action. Argument three, animals cannot consent to interventions that would prevent their breeding. So it is true that some interventions, although not all of them, would impact wild animals in such a way that you would want to get their consent if you could. But unfortunately, it isn't always possible to get their consent. Sometimes when someone is about to be harmed or do harm to a sufficient degree, we intervene to prevent that without stopping to get their consent. I actually think a lot of people would condone this form of intervention in the human context if it were actually a similar case. And maybe Agnes observes, we would usually not need to do anything by force in the human case. Most compassionate parents would be able to understand that they should not have a child if their child would face a 7 in 8 risk of dying and excruciating death before reaching adulthood, much less if the risk is 99 in 100 or worse. No force would be needed provided the parents are minimally compassionate. But in the circumstances where humans are in the same situation that the wild animals are we're talking about, Magnus says this. So in order to make this an accurate analogy, the human parents in question would have to live in circumstances or have some genetic condition that would mean that their children would face extraordinarily bad chances of reaching adulthood, such as a 1 in 100 chance, and it would have to be impossible to convince these parents to use birth control. Should we not intervene in that hypothetical case? Anyone who says no is, I maintain, guilty of not taking seriously the victims whom these parents are sure to create. Argument 4 humans shouldn't be imposing their morality on other species. So this could mean two things. It could either mean that we can't judge animals by our standards, or it could mean that we shouldn't be controlling animals to fit with our sense of morality, which interventions would be doing. So I've already covered the first part in an earlier part of the video where I talk about how animals are not moral agents, and so it doesn't make sense to judge them by our moral standards. But for the second one, I don't see why we would not influence or control the behavior of animals where appropriate to prevent harm. We do this all the time with humans. So for example, with children, we just create them and then force them into a society that already has pre-established moral norms and force them in most cases to abide by those moral norms. Now, of course, there's healthy debate to be had about what the moral norms should be, but by and large, we consistently force children who are unconsenting participants to adhere to our moral norms. To not do this with animals would be speciesist because the reason we do it is in the vast majority of cases because the victims of the harm are animals themselves. 
So, in conclusion, animals are indeed included in antinatalism, but only to an extent. I think the most sensible position to take on this is a sentiocentric one, where we recognise that all sentient beings are harmed by their coming into existence, but that we can only judge the moral agents among them for the creation of those sentient beings. We should also recognise that along with the animals that are excluded from the normative part of antinatalism, there are also many humans that are excluded from the normative part of antinatalism and that we should go beyond antinatalism to help those that are brought into this predicament out of no fault of their own. Let me know if you think animals should be included in antinatalism and what you thought of my arguments for including animals in antinatalism and I'll see you in the next one.